Welcome to Ambition's Apex, your guide to mastering the art of physique transformation and achieving peak performance across all arenas of life. Our mission is not just to sculpt bodies, but to change lives, empowering you towards excellence. Dive in with us as we explore insights and strategies designed to elevate you towards your journey of self-improvement. Enjoy the ascent. Noah, I am very excited to have you here. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, when you asked me, I was super honored, honestly. Really grateful. Yeah. Yeah, you've always had such good energy. So I'm really excited that we're like connecting this way and uh, getting to talk a little bit more and share your story. So tell me, I want to know a little bit more like early on, some things that inspired you to pursue bodybuilding and chase uh, being a professional athlete within the sport. Yeah, great question. I actually started bodybuilding in 2017 and I did it the way we all preach not to do. I just jumped right in. I didn't have a lot of background lifting at all. I was a swimmer and I played water polo in high school. So I was previously like an athlete, but I was never very good. I was very mid, I would say. <laughs> and uh, when I got to college, I was like, okay, I, I need something to do to keep me, myself in shape. And so then I started kind of going to the gym and then I saw a friend go through a prep and I watched how much it, it changed her as far as like her routine, the discipline, and then obviously like the physical change. And I was like, I think I could do something like that. And so I just went all in. I hired a coach and he put me in prep immediately because I told him like, yeah, I, I want to do a show. Um, and I feel like back then in 2017, you say you want to do a show, you hire a coach, that coach is like, okay, yeah, I'll put you on stage. There was no, you need to grow or here's how you adhere to a meal plan. Here's how you track food. Like I had no previous knowledge. And so it was literally just, I jumped right in and went for it. And that very first show, like that whole first prep, I did everything to a T. Like I was a hundred percent on, not a single thing went undone. And at the end of it, when I stepped on stage, it was the most rewarding feeling ever just to know everything that I had done in the past few months culminated up to that. And I just knew, okay, cool. This is a sport I could really excel in because everything you do result, like there's a direct result from it. Whereas like, I think with other sports, like team sports, it's not always in your control. Like it's not always up to you on the outcome. Whereas like with competing, how you step on stage, how you look, that outcome is directly related to what you do. So I felt like, okay, I could be really, really good at this. And ever since then, that's just, I've been competing. I did 2017, 2019, 2020, 2021, got my pro card. And then I've had a hiatus since then. So I'm like itching to get back on that stage. <laughs> Did you have a pretty strong passion for fitness before competing? And what did kind of the transition look like other than what you've already shared? I, I had a bit of an interest in fitness, but it wasn't until I found bodybuilding and, the, and the, the, everything that the sport entailed that I really got passionate about it. I think I'd always been interested in nutrition and staying fit. I grew up in Southern California, so lots of beach days, lots of being around fit looking people. But me, myself, I didn't have that interest until I actually started doing it myself. Mm. And did having that goal really, really like help drive you? And also, did you ever experience, because a lot of times when people really just jump into the sport uh, kind of on a whim, they'll end up uh, having some level of resentment towards certain aspects of the sport. Was there any sort of negative thoughts towards the sport after your first experience? Not really, no. I think I'm one of the very lucky ones that the environment I was in was very conducive to whatever I was doing. So I was still in college at the time. And even though my friends didn't understand it and they would make fun of me sometimes, but in a very like gentle way that we were just able to kind of laugh about it. They'd be like, oh, she's having her 12 almonds again. But I think I have the kind of personality. I just let that roll off me. So after the prep, going through the reverse, blew the reverse, had no idea what I was doing. Like I didn't understand. I didn't have the education. So coming off the show, I, I gained 20 pounds off the rip. Um, and anyone who's gone through that, they understand that is not a fun experience. But even going through that, it didn't deter me from the sport. It just made me wonder why. I was like, why am I so hungry? Why can't I feel full? Why did I gain all this so quick? Not in a 
negative way though, it was more so just what is happening and why and what can I do next time to do better? Because I, I knew there had to be a way that, that you could do this better. I saw competitors like on Instagram. This is when like fitness on Instagram started getting big. I was following like Courtney King, Angelica. And so I was looking to them and I knew I did something wrong here. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to I'm going to do better. <laughs> It's good that you're able to hold yourself accountable and take responsibility for that and learn from those lessons. And I find from experience with athletes as well, it's kind of hard to have that perspective with reverse dieting until you've kind of gone through it and learned from experience. So what are things, some things that you think athletes can do better in terms of setting expectations heading into their first reverse diet? Yeah, absolutely. I think half of that is the coach's responsibility as well just setting the expectations and letting them know honestly this is how you might feel and that's okay it's it's normal because you're putting your body through such an extreme process coming out of that it's still going to feel restrictive it's still going to feel extreme you're you're not just done with the show and then done dieting there's still a process so i like to say prep doesn't end on the show date prep ends you know, six, eight weeks after the show. So personally, I like to just have a conversation with my athletes and, and let them know, hey, this doesn't mean that it's not going to be hard. But if you can have the expectation that there might be some struggles or some challenges, or you might feel a way that you've never felt before, and that's okay, we'll, we'll deal with that when it comes up together. I think that's helped a ton. Yeah, absolutely. And I always err on the side of over communication with these things in terms of setting expectations. But sometimes no matter how much we communicate it, you know, there's a low I discussed this with Celeste from um, Confessions of a Bikini Pro recently. We did a recording and she was talking about how a lot of times it can be from a level of like over being over um, optimistic about how well that they can handle it. And then they're kind of scheduling vacations immediately after the prep and heading to Mexico and binging a little bit and drinking a lot and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, those are good things, good um, insights into how people can maybe hold a little bit better expectation heading into that reverse diet. Um, do you feel like the second reverse time that you reverse dieted, you were able to execute a lot better? Yeah, absolutely. I had a better understanding. I knew what was going on. It, it wasn't perfect. It took me a couple tries to get the reverse phase down um, to a place where I'm comfortable with it. But the second time around, it was easier mentally because I knew what to expect. I knew it was going to be hard. I communicated, you know, appropriately with my friends and family. Hey, it's going to be hard. I'm going to be hungry. If you guys can help me out, you know, put the snacks out of reach, out of sight. If if I'm looking kind of weird, you know, ask me what's up because I'm probably thinking about food. I just I set myself up a little bit better for success. Like you said, almost the over communication aspect and like leaning on your support systems. If you live with people or if you have friends or family that you're around all the time, they can be really helpful post show because there's only so much that like we as coaches can do. We're not in the house with the athlete. We can't see what they're doing. So I, I always say like lean on your support systems as much as you can and just let them know like post shows hard and I, I'd love some extra support. Like here's how you can best support me because that it'll be different for every athlete too. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that I always talk a lot about setting boundaries with your loved ones and the people that are closest to you. So what are some ways that you communicate those boundaries to people? And do you maybe pull them aside at times be like, hey, listen, this is something that's very important to me. I need your support on this. These are some things we can do to approach this better. Um, like, for example, if you're going out to eat, maybe communicating ahead of time, like, hey, this is something that's important to me. Um, the way that I'm behaving may seem a little bit weird, but uh, this is just something that's very important to me and to my health as well. So what are some ways that you, uh, some tools you use to communicate these things? Yeah, I, I think number one is really self-awareness and being able to identify your weaknesses. So for me personally, I already know when I'm going out post-show for food, I have a massive sweet tooth. So, and everybody around me knows that too. So I let them know, hey, we're going out to eat. I'd really prefer if we order one dessert for the table and we all split it. Because otherwise, if you guys enable me and allow me to order the five desserts that I want, it's just not gonna be good. It doesn't serve me. And I almost make it a joke, like I'll joke with them about it or I'll say, you know, I really wanna share, um, but, I think over the years, it's it's really just been communication and 
letting the people around me know exactly what my goals are. Like I, I'm not in the sport for fun, to be honest. Like I'm very competitive. I have really big goals within the sport. So like my boundaries are what choices I'm making in the moment. Like do they serve those bigger goals? Like that's always in the back of my mind. And so telling them, hey, this is my big goal. This is what I'm trying to achieve. And us going out to eat or us doing this activity, I, I want to participate, but I can't, or I'm choosing not to. And I'd love if I could just be present and you guys just accepting that. Um, I think it, it really comes down to having the awareness about like who you are, what your weaknesses are, what you're willing to sacrifice or what, what you have strong boundaries around really. Um, and that just comes from self-awareness. It also comes from experience. Like as I've gotten more experienced as a competitor, it's helped me realize, yes, these things serve me or no, these things no longer serve me. So I don't want to do them. Absolutely. And a lot of those things intertwine too. that, um, that kind of self-understanding kind of comes with experience and time and then learning to set those boundaries on the front end and that communication and setting expectations on the front end is just extremely valuable um, to maintain healthy relationships too. You mentioned just being present as well. And what are some tools you use like during actual contest preps to remain present with people? Because a lot of people will completely refrain from social interaction. And I think that that's like a good way to be able to maintain some level of balance during a contest prep. I think the more you deprive yourself of like the most like fundamental pleasures of life, the more that pendulum is going to swing back uh, on the back end. So what are some things you do and incorporate to stay present and to connect with people during preps? So I'm very intentional about how I spend my time and energy. And again, like that's come with time for sure. I'm, I'm better able to say no currently than I was maybe previously, but I actually really encourage like myself and others to try and stay as social as you can during prep, because I've found if you don't start building an identity around yourself as just a competitor, then coming out of it is a little bit less jarring. So what I like to do is continue to engage in things that I normally do outside of prep. I just might modify them. So I really like being outside, hiking, going out to new restaurants, hanging out with my friends. I like doing all of those things. So in prep, like what I try to do is be very intentional with my weeks and my time. So if I know like, okay, Sunday's always a rest day for me or Wednesday's always a rest day for me, then I'll schedule things on those days. Like it could just be one or two simple things, going for a walk with a friend or going to a bookstore with a friend, picking out a book, sitting with them. That way they still feel like I'm I'm there with them and I can be present in the moment, but it's nothing surrounding food. It's nothing that's causing me extra stress because it's a new experience or something I don't like to do. Um, I really just doing my best until usually the end of prep. So something that I've also started doing is around six weeks out, I'll have a conversation with my partner or my friends or my family, whoever's really around me on a daily basis. And I'll say, hey, I'm six weeks out. I'm exhausted because that's usually for me, like that's the marker of when everything's locked in. The tunnel vision's really strong and I truly don't have energy to dedicate anywhere else besides like my work and my prep. And so I'll communicate with them at that point. Hey, I have six weeks to really bring it home and this is very important to me. So I just want to let you guys know if I'm a little distant or withdrawn or we don't see each other for a little bit, this is why. And after the show, I would love to reconnect with you or I'd love to do something with you in order to help strengthen the relationship again, because otherwise I, I've been in the position where I just isolate for the 20 plus weeks and then I come out and I'm like, why doesn't anyone want to hang with me? <laughs> They're like, we haven't seen you in months. Like you haven't talked to us. And so just realizing that there's m way more to life than just the prep and, and doing what you can to invest in the relationships that are around you so that they're still around you when the prep is done. Yeah, I've been there too. My second show, uh, like four weeks out, I just pushed everybody out. <laughs> and my entire identity was wrapped up in getting first split. Like I, I wanted the overall at the show. 
And at the end of it, I was like, it was terrible. I was like completely lost and empty. And I learned so much, so many fundamental things from that experience in terms of just the relationships and maintaining those. And the these, like I said, the simple pleasures and fulfillment you can get from those relationships and maintaining a level of community. Um, and then that communication on the front end, like you mentioned, where it's like, hey, like I'm going into this phase of something, it's going to be challenging and setting expectations for people. Because if you um, go into that kind of mode where you're self isolating and then you like lash out at everybody around you, it could be far worse, right? Yeah. Um, and so you just learn so many fundamental lessons. And that's why I think that there's so much value in bodybuilding and going through the experiences of it, not just for like as an athlete and maturity as an athlete, but maturity across all areas of life, whether that be relationships, business, or whatever. So what are some other ways that you translate some lessons you've learned within bodybuilding into other areas of life? Man, I feel like you touched on it already because it is, it's such a big catalyst for improvement across the board. So from bodybuilding, bodybuilding taught me the value of having a routine, discipline, doing things when you don't feel like doing them. All of that stuff has translated into my work life, my relationship, my friendships, um, even things like really small, just how I hang out with myself. I feel like there's moments when, okay, I don't want to go read this book, but I know one, I really like reading. Two, I was really excited about this book at a certain time. And like three, I need a way to refill my cup and I know that this will be it. I'm just just because I don't feel like it doesn't mean that I shouldn't do it or can't do it. And I think with bodybuilding, it's just really taught me to lean into that, that almost emotional like regulation and then realizing that, Hey, just because I don't feel like it right now, doesn't mean that I never will. And also I, I just think the routine has been so huge for me because before I used to be very free for very free flowing I didn't have a routine. I'd wake up anytime I wanted. I would go do whatever during the day that I had to. And then I'd end the day feeling super anxious, really stressed. And I would always wonder why. Like in college, I felt really lost. I was very anxious all the time. I think it was because I didn't have that routine. And once I found it, I tell everybody this. It's like when you have structure, there's so much more freedom in your day because you have this structure and you already know what you have to get done, what's going to get done. And within that those parameters, there's freedom for you to move around. So I personally think that bodybuilding helped me like construct my entire life because without it, like I wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be a coach. I wouldn't be doing the things that I'm doing. And so I, I, I give a lot of credit to bodybuilding for helping me figure out what I wanted to do in life and, and how to achieve that. Absolutely. I find that there's like a, a kind of a spectrum in terms of personality types with this too, where you either enjoy creating structure for yourself or you really like structure like imposed upon you or you just really don't do well with structure at all and you're like really free flowing and like thrive in that um and i find like you know people like you and i we do really well by like really creating our own structure around what we're trying to accomplish um so that's really really valuable and it can be an extremely valuable tool in any area of life that you can learn from bodybuilding. Um, the discipline piece is huge too, because a lot of what you've discussed is just delayed gratification, right? And yeah. that helps us a lot with emotional regulation too, where we're not just chasing little dopamine hits and our emotions are kind of all over the place and letting social media just run our emotions throughout the day because that's the first thing we do in the morning or whatever it may be. So what are some other practices that you have or maybe things you refrain from um, to help with emotional regulation um, and like reward system kind of type stuff? Yeah, I love what you said about delayed gratification. Like I'm huge on that. So some of the things I've started doing just like in my daily life are more, um, it's been more like that delayed gratification being not getting on my phone. I feel like you hear that all the time. People say it all the time, but truly waking up to your alarm, turning it off and then walking away from your phone, like putting it down and walking away is really hard. And I'll admit it, it's taken me a long time to figure that out for myself, but truly like the first 30 minutes of my day, I do not look at my phone. I don't look at anything. I click the alarm, put it down, face down. It's on do not disturb because I want to start my day with like a 
clean slate. That's what I like to think of with a fresh mind. And so I'll either pick up a book, I'll read for 20 minutes, or I'll go do cardio. Uh, I don't listen to music, don't listen to anything. I just, tr my cardio is low right now. So it's easy for me to just go do it. Uh, start my day with a challenge. So not being on my phone, not going on social media. Those are big because I, I'll admit I get sucked in. I'll go on social media for one thing. And next thing you know, you're on somebody's story. So I'm really trying to get a lot better about that. I just, I have time blocks where it's like, okay, I'll go on Instagram, do these things. And then it's done. Like after the timer goes off, we're done. Um, delaying my coffee. That's been huge. I love coffee. I know you're big into coffee too. Mm -hmm. So I used to wake up and just crave it instantly. Like I was like, man, I really want my coffee, but I've been delaying it more and more and more just so that I can have better focus later in the day when I finally do have caffeine at like noon. Mm -hmm. One, it's a little dopamine because I've delayed it. And so I finally get to have it. But then two, it helps a lot more with me powering through my work. Um, just other things too. I've been trying to be a little bit more financially savvy. So living in downtown Austin, it's so easy to go outside and go to a shop or go to a coffee shop or you, you're just if you wanted to, you could spend like 50 bucks a day just like walking around down here. And so I've been delaying gratification in that way by challenging myself to go out on walks or go work outside of home and not buy anything. And that's really hard. <laughs> but I just think finding little challenges for myself has been really helpful. So if I find that there's something I'm doing that doesn't align with who I want to be or like the best version of myself, then I'll, I'll set a little challenge in place and try to find a way to delay that or to like break the habit in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I'm really big on finding those little things and then getting competitive with myself about it and setting a challenge. And I think that's actually probably a way of getting a little dopamine, but I think that that's probably better than the alternative at like leaning into the bad habits. So. That's yeah, I think the importance here is like a level of intentionality with everything, right? Like we all have some level of vice and maybe not perfection within some of these things, which is okay. It's just the intentionality behind it and understanding and regulating yourself. Because if you refrain from like any reward, like simple reward, like you're just going to, the pendulum is going to swing back at some point and that's not good either, right? So uh, it's kind of like the stoicism kind of mindset where we have some level of balance, but we have intention with when we do indulge in something, right? So like for myself with the coffee thing, um, my kind of negotiation with myself is I really, really enjoy having coffee like right when I wake up. Yeah. And so my negotiation is that I have to like drink in a certain amount of water with some minerals and stuff in it first. Um, before I do that, I have to make my bed first before I do that. Uh, there's things I have to do before I get my coffee. And then once I do get my coffee, I don't get any more coffee for the day. My, my caffeine cap is like done. I get two shots of espresso and then I am done. So it's just like you kind of delay those pleasures even more, even though it's like a little bit of an instant thing. So just that intentionality, right? Very valuable stuff. Um, kind of like switching gears back just a little bit because we kind of like followed some paths, which is awesome. I love it. Um, but can you describe like the moments like where you knew that being a professional bodybuilder was within your grasp? Oh man. So I was a little delusional. I'll be honest. I was, I was delusional going into 2020. So I'd been competing at that point for like three years and my coach in Colorado at the time, he said, yeah, you know, you've got great shape. We'll kind of see. He never mentioned pro card at all but he said yeah we can go to nationals we can see in my head i thought okay cool i'm turning pro like this is it i just i was so optimistic about myself <laughs> which looking back it's just hilarious because you look back at your stage shots or whatever and you're like yeah i, I wasn't anywhere close but i think having that delusional belief in myself that i could go pro even helped catapult me to 2021 so 2021 i did three shows that year we started prep maybe march and then i competed in texas i won an overall that was the first overall i'd ever won so that was incredible that feeling and then after that they paid my way winning the show they paid my entry to north americans so i got to go to another national show and i got third 
So that was kind of the turning point where when I was asked, do you want to do another national show? Because there was the amateur O and then nationals in December. And it's like September at that point. There was like 16 weeks till nationals. And I thought, you know what? Yeah, let's let's push for it. I just got third. I think I could at least get second. Like I wanted first, of course, but I knew, okay, I just got third. If we go to nationals and we make the improvements that the judges are asking for, I think I can do it. So I just had that underlying belief in myself, but really that prep was one of the hardest I've ever done. And then weirdly, this is going to sound so weird. Peak week of December in 2021, going into trying to get my pro card, I actually totaled my car. I got into a big car accident and I was fine. And so was the other guy, but cars were destroyed. And I remember something about that. I was like, this is a bad situation that I could either let derail me and I could be stressed and I could, you know, have my cortisol go up and I could make excuses for not being able to go to the gym and X, Y, and Z, or I could use this as an obstacle to overcome and have almost that like chip on your shoulder mentality. So I was talking to a friend and she actually said, you know what, Jimmy Marley, actually, she's an IFBB pro as well. I was talking to her and she said, you know what? My peak week before I went pro, I crashed my car too. So I actually think it's a good sign. And just hearing that, I was like, you know what? You're right. I think this is it. So <laughs> that, that was kind of the moment getting through that, like coming out the other side of the car accident, just totally unscathed and knowing that, hey, every day until uh, show day right now, biggest thing is going to be mitigating my stress and like not allowing this to get to me. This is the test, right? Like I was like, this is this is what will stand between me and my pro card and I'm not going to let it derail me. Um, so at that point, I kind of knew, I guess. It was like the car accident. <laughs> I love that. And I always say it's not delusion if you end up accomplishing it, right? right. <laughs> realistic if anything so i always say like you know um shoot for the moon and land in the stars so right. it's, um it's good to have some healthy level of optimism and i guess you could call it some level of delusion right but i love the car the car accident story because um during my first prep ever uh hurricane harvey hit houston which is where i live and the entire city was underwater and we lost power um, we lost everything we had tornadoes touching down I went and stayed with my parents during the time and there was my entire neighborhood was flooding we lost electricity i'm very blessed that my family had a, a has a very large generator that could power things but i never missed a single session of cardio i didn't miss any training i didn't miss any meals i didn't miss a single thing there were tornadoes touching down in our neighborhood mm -hmm. there i was just like locked in and i didn't let any of it bother me so I think that there's a lot of value in stories like that. Is that a story that you tell your athletes at all whenever they're dealing with difficulties? I actually haven't, but I will now. <laughs> yeah, I always tell that story. The, like my first prep, I dealt with some crazy things. So it always kind of like puts things in perspective for athletes a little bit. Like, oh, maybe my troubles aren't so serious. Because sometimes mm -hmm. when you're in a prep, you know, you we're, none of us are perfect, right? And sometimes we may feel like a victim about certain situations or like reach an optical and really be like, woe is me kind of thing. So um, it's important to like remember back to stories like that and how like simple and minimal the, the problem in front of you is, right? Yeah. And I think having that mindset is is what's really key. It's the difference between a good athlete and a great athlete because there's always going to be things that happen outside of our control, it's how you respond and how you carry yourself moving forward. So, you know, you and I easily during our preps could have let those things be an excuse. Mm -hmm. And instead we just did the things we, we knew there were, there's a job to be done and we did what it took. And I think being able to step on stage, overcoming those things is such a fulfilling feeling because you know, you didn't give yourself any excuse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love that. Um, what is like, what are some of the biggest challenges you faced on the journey leading up to you um, getting your pro card outside of the car accident? It was the time between the shows mentally was a huge battle because it was just enough time to 
come out of a show, reverse a little bit, and then go right back into a deficit. And so it wasn't like, oh, a back-to-back -back show where two, three weeks in between. 16 weeks is a big amount of time. And, and I think mentally it was really difficult for me to understand the process because at that time as well, I wasn't a coach. So I was just an athlete. Of course, I'd picked up things like across the years from my previous coaches, but I almost didn't understand the process at that point because in my mind, I was like, well, why didn't I just stay stage lean the whole time? I, I was almost upset that, you know, I gained this weight and now I'm working to get it back off and not understanding that it's almost like I was creating resistance within myself. So the second time around trying to peel the layers off and get even leaner than I was at North Americans was really difficult. Um, honestly, like the protocols themselves, I, I didn't have an issue with. It was more just the mental fortitude that it took. And I think going through that and realizing each week that I just have to execute and I just have to trust, that was the biggest builder of resiliency, like going through that and understanding, okay, I just have to lean in. I might not understand the why right now, and that's okay. I just have to do the thing. The other hardest part of those preps, because it was such a long season for me, honestly, it was my relationship. Um, I wasn't good at communicating during that time, how I was feeling, what was going on. It was just, I'm a robot. I don't have energy. Any like conflicts that came up, I was just disengaged, like wouldn't be able to have like a normal conversation. It would just be me either going like, okay, whatever, because I was so tired, but not being able to work through that. So that was really difficult. I remember coming out of that prep and we had to do a lot of like relationship repair, reconnecting, you know, go on trips and really talk about what happened during the prep because I wasn't really myself. I became like a shell of myself. So that's something that moving forward, I don't ever want to happen again. And that's why I do stress so heavily, like with my athletes, with myself, that communication it is truly key. That, that was a really hard time on my relationship. And I don't want to go through that ever again. <laughs> I'm really impressed with your level of like re personal responsibility and accountability with those things. Cause I think a lot of people can, um, you know, build like externalize a lot of that accountability and that responsibility onto whether it's the sport itself or your coach or the people that are around you or whatever it may be. And it's important to take responsibility for yourself because what that induces is a level of learning like you're mm -hmm. learning so much and you're applying it going forward and you're able to apply those lessons instead of having some level of resentment towards whatever it may be you know sometimes there's other things at play and other people do need to take you may need to play some level of responsibility or accountability on somebody else but always like self-reflecting and being like what can i do better and how could i i have handled that better is so valuable as an athlete um, one thing you mentioned was the, how it was much more challenging to get lean the mm -hmm. um, when you're doing North Americans. Now that's something I don't see talked about a lot and something I've been kind of harping on a little bit. Um, Austin Stout talks about this sometimes too is, um, and this can vary too, like genetically, hormonally, and some other things that can contribute to this. But um, let's talk a little bit about what that looked like in terms of how easy it was to get lean the first time around and then how it's maybe gotten a little bit more challenging each time um, if things haven't played out exactly timeline wise how they should yeah i think for females especially this is really important to understand we only have a finite amount of preps in us there's only a, a number of times that you as an individual as an athlete that your body will have the resilience to go through what you're putting it through. And over time, like we're talking about, it does get more difficult. There needs to be more tools used or more strategies or different strategies in order to get us stage lean each time. It's not gonna be the exact same each time. So first couple preps, absolutely. My body was young, healthy. I was really just all in 100% like, I think that mindset as well helped, but over time, like my fourth and fifth preps, I started to notice, hey, my body doesn't respond as quick. It seems like I have to go to more drastic measures. I, I'm doing more cardio, have to do less food. I, I've been using, uh, using PEDs as well, and like the PED duration, dosage, 
the PEDs I'm using like are all getting a little bit different than what I'm used to. And so especially that year uh, going for my pro card, getting lean for the summer show in Texas, pretty standard, not too bad of a prep. I felt like it, not that it was easy, but it was, it was cut and dry. Very, like everything went as expected, very linear. And then North Americans, we didn't change a whole lot. We just kind of skated into there, but the feedback was leaner from the back. And so 16 weeks to get leaner from the back, you wouldn't think would be that hard, but it was, my body was done. I think she, <laughs> my body was tired and there were just a lot of different things that we had to try and pull. There was more stress mitigation. So I had more refeed days. I had more deloads like, or just completely, you know, no training, no cardio for like three days at a time. And my body would drop. But then as soon as we'd start, you know, back to cardio, back to baseline macros, everything like that, I would shoot up five pounds and then wouldn't lose at all. So it was just, it was a very interesting prep and we did have to go to depth. So it was like, you know, two hours of cardio a day, sub 900 calories, which to outsiders who don't understand the sport, of course, they're going to think, oh, that's terrible. Like mm -hmm. that's terrible protocol, but it's what is necessary for me to get stage lean. That is what my body had to go through in order for me to step on stage and win my pro card. And I don't hold any bad feelings towards it. I understand. I understand that that's what it was because I was asking a lot of my body. And I think going through that process myself has allowed me to communicate that with my athletes as well, that, hey, we might have a smooth sailing prep one year and then a really hard prep the next year. And it just is what it is. But Fortunately, I think being a coach and being able to learn from people who have walked this path before, now I can understand, yeah, as a female, I need to take care of myself hormonally. I need to get more regular blood work done, and I need to actually stay on top of my supplementation, my recovery, all of those things, because I, I won't be able to compete forever. And I think maybe when I was young and reckless, I didn't realize that. And now that I do, there's a lot more things in play that I think more athletes just need to be aware of, especially females. Absolutely. It's so valuable that you are able to self-reflect so much and have a deep level of understanding about why those things were occurring and really um, try to have an understanding going forward so that you can um, maybe approach it uh, from maybe less of an aggressive standpoint where you're like, I want this reward fast. I want to get to the show on uh, to earn the pro card, whatever it may be. And I think that's really valuable for people to hear that being a little bit more um, tedious in terms of setting up their timeline and having a lot of patience behind it too um, may prevent them from having to shut down their bodybuilding career earlier and maybe have a lot more longevity in the sport. And it's important that we're noting that a lot of this is for, for females, uh, generally speaking as well, because I've talked about this on a recent podcast too, where it's like at some, your body's like, okay, everything's fine and dandy. And then you push it to an extreme where you get stage lean and your body's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't do that again. Right. Yep. And this is like the way I'm explaining this is very like anecdotal and, um, but, and then you do it again and your body's like, no, I don't want to go to these depths again. And then you keep doing it over and over again. And most coaches that are at any like decent level have experienced this with athletes before where somebody will come to them after they've competed a few times, you're optimistic. You're like, oh, you did great this time before. And then you're kind of like leaning into a prep and it's like, why, like things are really fighting us here, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's valuable for people to hear these things so that they can have more realistic expectations, especially if they've done a couple shows in the past and then they maybe move to a new coach and that coach is like optimistic. It's like, let's like, you know, they, but then it's like, maybe the body's not responding and you're like, oh, okay, we need to take a deeper look at this. Um, I think that these things are really valuable. Um, have you kind of experienced that with some athletes that have come to you so far? I have. Yeah. There's been a couple athletes who've done a few shows previous. They come to me. I, I'm like, okay, cool. Like let's, let's go. And we start a deficit. I, I never really put them straight into a prep, but we'll start, okay, let's do a cleanup phase, you know, cut a little bit, see what we're working with. And their body just does not respond. And then we get blood work done and everything's out of whack. Mm -hmm. And I just say, Hey, I think 
you know, you did three shows last year, your body's showing it. There's there's a little bit of wear and tear here and we got to we got to give your body time to recalibrate itself and that's going to come from honestly just time. Like there's just there's only so many supplements that you can give somebody to help optimize their health, but truly it just takes time. And some females don't want to hear that. Some some athletes don't want to hear that yeah, it might be a year or two before we can compete again. That's that's a really hard pill to swallow for especially newer competitors, I think, or or the more um, novice competitors maybe. But I've had that happen a couple times. I'm really fortunate that most athletes I have that conversation with where, hey, we, we might have to do a health phase here. They're willing to do what it takes and, and take the time because they have that understanding. But I, I have seen you know, stories or I've seen athletes who go from coach to coach to coach, just finding someone who will prep them. And it just doesn't go well because they're, they're really fighting against their body at that point. Sometimes our bodies just want to gain a little weight and re-optimize it themselves. And it just, it takes time. Absolutely. Time is like the most valuable thing. And I always say, if you want to expedite the time a little bit, it's best to work with a coach that's going to be like us where we're very focused on those things. It's like non-negotiable for me now. Like I do not put people straight into diets at all. I'm like, we need to pull labs. We need to, and if you're not willing to do that stuff, then I'm, I'm most likely not the coach for you. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some people will hop coach to coach and in search of somebody that will prep them. And maybe the coach does have a level of success with them and pushes them to the, those extremes um and you know throws the kitchen sink at them ped wise and they get a pro card and then they just toss them to the side so it's probably not the best strategy if you're concerned about your health long term um i saw something recently i can't remember where but it was like talking about how um coaches should maybe have like like a database for just like stats in terms of how many pro cards have been achieved and i don't think that that would be a positive thing because people would just go somebody that's like looking around for a coach that uh, is just going to take them on and put them into a prep like you may end up with um some you know negative results long term and i think that uh, yeah. you know don mentioned this on a podcast we recorded too is that athletes need to be their own health advocate too right absolutely like there there has to be some personal responsibility there it's not all on the coach and i do think coaches get sometimes kind of the shit end of the stick because they'll have you know, one athlete who maybe doesn't have a good experience with them and makes it dramatic and makes it known. And then all of a sudden that coach is having people attacking them when maybe the full story wasn't out there. Like there's always two sides to every story. Honestly, there's always three sides to every story. There's theirs and theirs and then the truth. Like, and I've found normally the truth is somewhere along the midline. So I, I, I don't see why it would be helpful to see stats around pro cards because there's also great coaches out there who maybe haven't had the amount of pro cards that you would think, or they're just getting really known within the industry, or maybe they're unknown in the industry. Um, Brittany Gillespie, the athlete who won nationals mm -hmm. our year, her coach originally uh, was a very small coach like on the Jersey shore, I'm pretty sure. And she keeps her team really small, but she brings quality athletes. Every time I see that coach's name pop up, her athlete is winning, but her team is super small. And I, I think that there's something to be said for coaches who invest in quality over quantity. Cause it, it's not all about the numbers. I, I could tell you off the top of my head and I'm not trying to sh throw shade, but I could tell you the top coaches in the bikini world, at least, and yeah, they have the stats, but there's also some other things to be considered, like PED usage, personalization of your plan. What what are you getting for the price that you're paying? And so it does come down to the athlete. Like, what are you looking to get out of coaching? If you do want just to be told what to do, you you want bare bones minimum coaching, that's okay. That's fine. Like, I have nothing against that. But if you're looking for a more comprehensive experience, like, there are coaches out there that haven't gotten pro cards and they're excellent. Mm -hmm. So I love that we're talking about this stuff because I feel like it's really not talked about enough and it really needs to get out there. Um, and you mentioned the first part of that was talking about how the responsibility, right? And there's a level, there's a level of responsibility of both the coach and the athlete. And when there's like a, a very synergistic level of that, there's a lot of respect between the two things and you can create a very positive dynamic i think that that's where we get like the best out of athletes not just for 
that pinpoint of time, but the longevity as well, where their health is taken care of long term, um, or like negative health effects can be mitigated, right, uh, to some extent, because bodybuilding can cause things based on the individual. But um, yeah, it's very valuable stuff to understand that. Um, and I think that it takes a level of maturity between the coach and the athlete to have that too. And I feel like a not enough bodybuilding coaches see things as like, this is a business. So we have to have a level of professionalism too. And I think that emotions can get very easily involved in the sport too, um, where there may start to lose some level of emotional regulation. There may be levels of attachment, whatever it may be, um, that can spell for some level of disaster too. And I've always seen like the Saga brand, for example, my vision for it was always more of like a boutique thing. So like more of a, it doesn't need to be this huge, um, like I always compare things to hotels cause I was in the hotel industry. So like, maybe I'm not this like giant JW Marriott that's like, uh, protruding in the middle of the city, but like, maybe I'm like a hotel Zaza over here that like people that come to my brand understand and appreciate the quality, even though it may be a smaller level team and maybe my stats are crazy. Maybe I'm not a publicly traded company or whatever it may be. But, um, I think that there's value in that. I think the people that seek that out will find it and we'll have a level of appreciation for it. And that's why, you know, I have people that have been with me for, I have one of my longest term um, personal training clients has been with me for like five years. So it's like, you know, when you have that level of longevity with people, they they understand it and they appreciate things. And it seems like um, that's what you guys seem to be doing as well too. Is that kind of the vision for you? Yeah, absolutely. I would rather be known for great service for, you get what you pay for and you get timely responses you get comprehensive like holistic i look at you as an individual and i look at you as a multifaceted complex human being and not just a number or not just an athlete i'm i'm really big on servicing my athletes and i i know my own limitations i don't want to get to a point where I'm not able to service them the way that I want. So I'm happy. Like you said, I'm happy being in my own lane, own bubble, servicing my people because those that want that kind of experience will find me. And it, it's not for everybody. And I understand that. I, I'm okay with that. Yeah, hundred percent. It's really valuable. Um, another thing you mentioned, what was it? What was that other thing you said? The last thing. Um, mm -hmm. Just like staying in my own lane? No, um, it's okay. We'll move on from that. <laughs> <laughs> um, how has some of your training and nutrition approaches evolved um, over this full process? And um, how are things kind of looking now compared to what they've been in the past? Man, they've evolved a ton. I would say like in the beginning, I didn't have a, a good grasp on like proper training. So my first like two years bodybuilding was really just me going in the gym and throwing weights around, not really understanding how to target certain muscles. So for a really long time, I haven't been able to grow my glutes because I just legitimately could not connect with them. Like the mental, the mind to muscle connection was so weak. I spend a lot of my days sitting. So I think that there's a lot of things that play into that, but also just learning to train. I, I didn't learn proper I guess, form, mechanics, just techniques. I was very much an on-the-go learner. So over the years, I do feel like I've gotten to a place where I'm very confident now in my own training, but it's taken a lot of work. It's taken a lot of time and learning and unlearning and honestly, just being open to trying different things as silly as it might look or seem in the gym, just trying different attachments, different movements, not really worrying about what anybody thinks of me, but truly just trying to find what works best for me. And then nutrition wise, I, I, I like counting macros, but I've honestly found for myself in like prep phases, meal plans are the way to go. I just prefer not having to think about it too much. But I, I think that's very athlete dependent. Like you'd probably agree. It depends on the athlete, how advanced they are, how much you trust them. But as far as nutrition goes, I, I know what foods work for me now. We've I've gone through trial and error. I, I know that certain foods like chicken, I cannot eat. It just doesn't digest well. I have a weird chicken thing. So that's just something I, I can't have. But other than that, just sticking to the foods that make me feel good, that I know digest well. And 
maybe controversial, but I've tried to eliminate my emotional tie with food. I understand that inherently food is going to carry some emotion just because of our society and like cultural things and just we're humans. We, we prefer some foods over others, like my sweet tooth. But I have worked really, really hard at becoming very food neutral and it served me really well um, as far as being a competitor. But from start to now, I actually do less, I would say. Like my training has evolved to the point where I'm not in there for a crazy amount of time, maybe about an hour. I have four or five exercises, some top sets, some working sets, um, but it's very much targeted towards my areas of improvement and what exactly I need to do to look my best on stage and be competitive. Um, and it's it's less just they're putting muscle on. So like as a beginner, you know, you're, you're just trying to pack muscle on. And then I feel like as you evolve, you realize, okay, here's where I actually need to narrow my focus. Absolutely. And it becomes more um, specified in terms of what you're targeting and what you're working on and what you need to bring up. And it's just refinement over long periods of time. A lot of people will see like a high level athlete or an Olympian bodybuilder and they're like, you know, seeing what they're doing training wise and trying to replicate that. But that has been refined over years and years and years. And it's very specific to what they're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, one thing you mentioned about like flexible dieting versus meal plan. I think that's an important topic to discuss too, because, you know, it's like we always see these polarizations, no matter what topic we're talking about, especially in Western culture, right? It's always some level of polarization. See, people always ask me, is it meal plans or is it macros? I'm like, it's both. Like we can, we can figure it out. Right. So a book I read a long time ago called conscious coaching, uh, talks a lot about understanding the psychology of the individual and understanding what's going to work for them, understanding archetypes and all these different things. So what are some things you do to kind of like feel out an athlete um, to like understand um, the coaching style that you need to approach them with um, and whether it be nutrition, training, whatever it may be? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I do ask them outright what kind of coaching they prefer, whether it's direct, whether they want more detail, less detail, but ultimately I can tell uh, going into it, how they respond to like my consult call to the questionnaire, the information that they're giving me, I can start to tell how they operate. And I can usually guess pretty with pretty accurate um, understanding how like what they're going to respond best to. So generally, I find like more of the neurotic, like type A kind of competitors who are like, just tell me what to do. Like they just want a meal plan. They, they genuinely just want to know what do you want me to eat and when. With, with those athletes, depending on what stage they're in, I do try to teach them, hey, we can have variety in the diet. Hey, I know that you want me to tell you, but if we're in a growth phase or we're, we're, we're looking at a long off season, I want them to understand that this, this level of like restriction that they're putting themselves through isn't necessary to be successful. And I'm not saying, you know, no guardrails at all, but we can have a meal plan and then I'll provide them swaps. I'll say, here are the macros for these meals. This is your meal plan, but I want you to get variety in your diet. I want you to feel free to make these swaps and here are some choices. So I'm a little bit more detailed in that regard. I'll, I'll give them the meal plan, the macros, the calories, and I'll say, I want you to play with this. I want you to get very comfortable with switching things in and out because we're in a, in a season where you can do so. With contest prep athletes, I'll ask their preference, but generally once we get to a certain point around like eight weeks out or 12 weeks out, just depending like how much more we've got to go, I'll switch them over to a meal plan. But I ask them, what foods are you have you been eating? Have you been consistently eating these? Are they causing any issue? And then I go ahead and just make them a meal plan because in that regard, it's a lot easier to control for the variables. Like getting to stage, it requires a degree of accuracy that I just don't trust with my athletes just yet. Like none of, I've been coaching for about two years. So none of my athletes really, we've been together longer than that. And they all, I think while they adhere I think during a contest prep phase, if you're hungry, you, you know, you might be susceptible to some things and most of them are new competitors as well. So I just think meal plan is the, is the safest route to go in terms of being accurate for the prep. But 
I've also had athletes come to me, I'm sure you have too, where they are so against meal plans. They don't want a meal plan. They say they like being able to change up their foods. And so in that case, I'll make them one, but give them the macros and I'll say here, I'd like it to be structured this way, mm -hmm. but you are free to count your macros. <laughs> Just please be smart about it. Mm -hmm. And so it, it really depends on the athlete. And I, I can usually generally tell just based on our interactions, which one they're going to be. <laughs> yeah, honestly, I do things the exact same way. So the food swaps, um, free meals are a great tool too, especially in off season and health phases. And sometimes those neurotic clients, like I'm like, I try to help them mitigate like levels of guilt from free meals too. Cause I'm like, it's a free meal. You can have it. They're like, what do I eat? I'm like, no, it's a, it's literally, you can eat whatever the hell you want. It's not going to negatively impact you. I'm taking it into account when I'm looking at the data and everything. Right. And then like, it'll be like, did you have anything off plan kind of question? And they'll be like, Oh, I had this, this, this. I'm like, was this your free meal though? They're like, yes. I'm like, then it was on plan, you know? So trying to disconnect that level of guilt. Yeah, I like that. It, it's part of the plan. So you're not off plan. You're good. <laughs> exactly. So it like it kind of reframes people's thought process towards food and can help them long term with their relationship with food as well. Because, I mean, bodybuilding is extreme. There's really no way around it. If you want to be extremely competitive, then we're going to have to push the extremes to some extent. And so there is going to be, depending on the person and depending on a lot of things, like there's going to be some level of negative impact somewhere, yeah. right? Um, so it's understanding that and trying to mitigate that where it doesn't need, like where it's unnecessary. Um, but for me, like the flexible dieting thing with contest preps, I try to establish that like before the prep. I don't really like to switch them into a meal plan in the middle of the prep necessarily. Um, but sometimes like I, I've talked about this on a recent podcast too. Some of it just comes down to like coach's preference too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's how we want to track things or how we do things or how we stay organized. So sometimes it's like a little bit of a, of a balance, right. Between the coach and the athlete. Yep. Um, what are some other like personality archetypes that you see within athletes that, and some of the other ways that you approach things? Cause we talked about like type A, like organized people. And sometimes like those, we have to coach. It's almost a little bit harder to coach those people because they can become pretty neurotic about tracking data. Um, and sometimes it can get a little bit out of hand in terms of how much feedback we're receiving from them too, where it's like, Hey, we really don't need to be reporting this much stuff. Let's try to like refine things down a little bit. Um, what are some other archetypes that you experience with athletes? Almost the opposite. So the, the, athletes who want to be very free flowing, they, they don't want a whole lot of restriction in any sense or structure. I see that, especially with newer competitors who don't necessarily understand what bodybuilding is. Maybe they've just seen the end result. So they're attached to the outcome before they start. And so they think, oh, it'll just be a little bit of dieting or a little bit of cardio and I'll, I'll be there. Um, I see there's just resistance to, you know, adherence, there will be missed variables, almost every check in. And, and that's kind of when it's like, hey, we need to have a conversation about what this process is, and, and whether or not it's right for you, and, and come to an understanding. Um, but there's also, I see personality types that range in the middle, those, those are my favorite, honestly, where there's a little bit of type A, but not to the point where they're stressing themselves out about every single variable. Those middle of the road athletes are really fun to work with, but I do find that those are actually usually people who've done it before. So they're not the newbies. They're not the uh, first time competitors. They're, they're maybe, they've already stepped on stage. They've done it a few times, or they've just been living this lifestyle for a really long time. So they, they already understand that healthy fit lifestyle mm -hmm. yeah and i find that the more free-flowing individuals like you said like kind of exploring like is this the right route for you too because it's important to note that bodybuilding isn't for everybody and it does require a level of organization and structure and if you're especially going into a peak and you're not able to be very structured and detail oriented it's going to be very difficult to have you at your best right on stage so um, it's important to note that stuff. The the middle line is definitely the fun athletes to work with. Um, I have an athlete. Uh, I'll just say his name. I don't think he'll mind. Jacob Carmona. He's the uh, bodybuilder that I had a, on the national level stage, and he just he's just on it year round, three sixty five, like literally just never off plan ever. 
like ever. This guy's just, and the whole time he just has this huge smile on his face. And it's just crazy to me. And he's like, I'm like, how are you feeling? He's like, I feel great. And it's just like <laughs> all the time. And I get him absolutely just like mind boggling peeled too. And I'm like, are you good? He's like, I'm good. <laughs> it's insane to work with people like that and super fun, but um, it always makes for a good experience. What are some other, we t touched on some things, but what are some other common mistakes you see with um, entry level bodybuilders when they're first getting into the sport? Not really understanding what they, they're signing up for. There's maybe misplaced like expectations or they just don't really realize what all of bodybuilding entails. So they'll come in and they won't understand that there are variables in place for a reason. So they don't understand like the diet or the training or why I ask for training videos, why I want to start posing with them. And everything's just kind of not a big deal to them. Like they, they want this thing, but their actions don't necessarily reflect that. That's something that I see a lot. Like new competitors don't really understand the, the discipline that is going to be needed to really compete at least at a high level. And so having that conversation again, like what are your goals in this sport? What are you looking to do? Because to be honest, if somebody says they're just prepping for fun, I tell them I'm not going to prep them. And I see that a lot with new competitors. They're like, Oh, I don't care. Like, I just want to step on stage. And I let them know, Hey, that's not a strong enough reason to put your body through this. It's, this is extreme and I'm not going to compromise your health just for fun. Mm -hmm. I think that there's nothing wrong with, having fun competing because it is really fun but there needs to be an underlying why a deeper reason why you are embarking on competing other than just for the body or just for the experience at least in my opinion like on a stage like the npc or ifbb like if you just want to compete for the i guess experience then there's summer shredding, there's transformations, like there's different routes that you can go. But personally, I just, I don't agree with just doing it for fun. And so if that's the reason why I usually tell them I'm not gonna do that and we can have a discussion, but we probably aren't a great fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of that is like uh, external projection of kind of needing that like carrot dangled in front of them in order to accomplish something. And a lot of times those kinds of individuals end up shooting themselves in the foot because they don't end up accomplishing it anyway. And they're just like really externalizing and they're not disciplined enough to do what's actually necessary to get there. And they see this excitement and they're like, I want to do that. But the actions just don't reflect, right? And setting realistic expectations around this. I, I talk about this all the time and have always talked about this because I was involved in so many different sports and athletics growing up is like understanding that it's, it's a sport and it's competing. You're mm -hmm. competing against other people. Like is it's a pretty serious thing and a lot of people take it very serious. So like you're really getting tossed in the wolves if you're just like, if you're just doing it for fun, like, you know, you may not have a very positive experience and you may get kind of eaten alive. You may end up with like a lot of, um, you know, you're getting compared to people that are taking it very serious too. So if you're, if you end up comparing yourself to that too, that could spell for some um, negative things mentally. And it's important to note. And like you said, when people come to me and they're like, I want to just do this for fun. I'm like, uh, if that's the case, I'm most likely not the right coach for you. Um, because most of us like are very competitive coaches if we're like very kind of specialized in bodybuilding, especially. So I'm like, or maybe we can like, let's do a photo shoot or let's do like, let's pick something else out. If you need that care dangled in front of you, um, because you're going to put less pressure on yourself too. And maybe you won't push your body to such an extreme where you could have negative health impacts and we're able to mitigate those things better. And we can just be more realistic with stuff and you'll still end up with that uh, body that you're much happier with and have like a, a strong milestone to, to strive for. Um, and, you know, we get those two where people are like, oh, I have a wedding coming up or whatever it may be. And so sometimes having those events are very, very valuable. So if you don't have anything, if anybody's listening to this and needs a goal and they're just wanting to get in bodybuilding for fun, do a photo shoot, uh, do something else, find some like plan a vacation on a beach, maybe do that. Um, do something where you don't have to push your body to such an extreme because you may have negative health impacts. And it is, it's an extreme and there's like the health side and then there's your mental side too. That's something I try to talk to them about as well is like, you might be in the best shape of your life 
and then get on stage and not win. And then you're going to feel like crap because you're going to wonder why you weren't good enough in a sense, like, especially if they're newer, especially if their like reason why wasn't very solidified and it was more externally motivated. It's really hard to mentally combat that, to, to go through the prep, to get on stage, feel your best. And then if you're not winning or, or you're not placing and you're being told, you know, your physique's not good enough that day, that can be very mentally disheartening. So yeah. being prepared for that as well. <laughs> I talked about this with Celeste too, um, especially from a female perspective, because um, in generally speaking, I'm not female, so, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, a lot of that comparison game is already happening, like through high school, through whatever it may be, through in social media. So you're already comparing yourself a lot. And there's a lot of pressure in terms of appearance and um, body image and stuff like that. And so when you get into bodybuilding, you are inherently being compared and you're mm -hmm. being put up on stage very vulnerable um, and very exposed and you're being directly compared to other women. Um, and you may have all put in the same level of effort towards this thing, um, but somebody's gonna come out on top and that can be a very, very difficult pill to swallow. Um, so what are some things you do to like combat that personally? Um, and to disconnect from like the comparison thing because you really are directly exposing yourself to that in bodybuilding. Yeah, just remembering that that is an aspect of it and, and being realistic with yourself I think is important. Personally, when I'm doing a show or when I have athletes who are going to do a show, you are not allowed to look at the show hashtag. Do not seek out competitors who are doing that show and stalk them on Instagram because I think that's a huge thing. That's exactly what you were talking about with the comparison. It's rampant. Like women compare themselves to each other from the time we're very young all the way up, you know, through the, our lifespan. And I think social media perpetuates that a lot. But at the end of the day, like it comes down to yourself setting those boundaries and also realizing like you you're in control of what you're letting in so for myself like whenever i'm competing when i've picked a show i do not look at who else is doing that show as much as much as i'm tempted to i already understand if i start looking at this girl's profile because i know she's doing the show oh i'm watching her story every day oh i'm wondering if i'm going to be ready and then all of a sudden my energy is focused on her and how i can beat her versus how can i be better how can i be ready and it's very cliche but everybody says like it's you versus you and that's that's truly what it is because you don't have control over anybody else but you do have control over yourself your thoughts your beliefs your actions and all the energy that you invest into yourself and your prep is what is going to show up on stage so don't let that like leak out to other people so that's kind of my number one thing is i just tell my athletes do not do that don't look at who's doing the show because it's just it, you're going to spiral you're just going to end up focusing on them and not on yourself mm -hmm. yeah and uh, we always i grew up racing motocross so we would always talk about running your own race if you're if you have a lot of technical things in front of you and you're moving fast and there's details that you need to pay attention to and you're focused on the other racer there's a lot of opportunity to mess up there mm -hmm. and fuck yourself up so it's not optimal to be focusing on somebody else when you really need to be focused on the task at hand especially when there's so many little tiny details and things that you need to be focused on like you said all you're doing is just expending that energy over there instead of expending it where it needs to be placed um i'm guilty of it because in the past i've uh, gone and done the show hashtag and watched all the other competitors that i was going to be competing against sometimes it would fuel me a little bit um just because i'm a really competitive person i'm like i'm going to beat them but you know it, it never ends up being a positive thing and that energy can be better expended just on focusing on yourself and you should have that high level of effort already you shouldn't be needing external fuel for that right so it's really finding that um energy within what are some other things that you do to like really keep that fire and that determination? And I don't like the word motivation necessarily, but it can help be helpful at times. It's just not like not having the reliance on it, right? So what are some things you do do to like bring in some motivation and some fire and some passion sometimes during contest probes? Uh, for myself or for my athletes? For yourself or your athletes too, that's good. Cool, for myself, 
I think I'm just, I'm very similar to you. I'm very competitive. Mm -hmm. I always have been. And I, I just think of it as like competing is something that I could be good at if I put all my energy into it. If I put my effort in, the more effort I put in, the more I'm going to get out. And that doesn't necessarily mean placing wise. It just means the improvements that I can make and the physique that I can build. And every time that I get on stage, I want to be better. I, I don't ever want to step on stage and look the exact same or worse than last time. So I just think about that every single time I get to step on stage. One, it's a privilege. Like I'm choosing to do this and I, I'm very grateful, very blessed that I get to choose to do this sport. I get to even compete. And so when I do step on stage, I want it to be my best. And so there's like a very strong internal drive. I think that competitiveness, it's always been in me. So I don't really know how I've cultivated it over the years other than I, I am successful with competing. And so I, I let that build me up and I try not to let it get to like my ego, but it is like, okay, I have bricks that I've stacked. Like I have evidence that I am good at this thing. It's not that I'm, you know, making it up in my head. And I realized like, of course the pro league is a, is a different ball game. Um, but what motivates me is knowing that I am entering into the pro league. Like the, the first show that I'll do this year will be my debut. And that in itself is a lot of motivation and there's a lot of internal pressure there as well to to do well because you only get one pro debut and while that can be pressure maybe that's like debilitating to some people like it might freeze people for me it really fuels me i'm like i only get one shot at stepping on the pro stage for the first time there's only one of those and so i want to make it count and it doesn't mean like, oh, I want to go out and win and X, Y, and Z. It's more so like I want to be competitive. I want to show up and look like I belong on the pro stage. So that right now is really what's fueling me. <laughs> yeah, and laying those bricks and having that like evidence, like you said, that's just confidence. You know, that's not necessarily things getting to your head at all. It's like I've accomplished these things and I've set out to do these things and I fulfill them, right? And that's just a level of confidence that those things can bring. And I always talk about this too, is a lot of self-confidence is built from the smaller tasks that you're promising yourself that you're going to accomplish. So if you're like, I'm going to do this thing and you follow through with it, that's like another brick you're laying, right? So when you are like, I'm gonna do this thing and then you don't do it, or I'm gonna do this thing, I don't, you find excuses, maybe that happens every once in a while and it could be a little bit of a hit to your confidence and we all have those things but it's like kind of the net positive are you laying more bricks than you're taking away right and that's what's going to result in more confidence that you're bringing into the world and to yourself too um and you're trusting yourself more that you can like set out to do something and like fulfill it right um yeah. that's something you kind of experienced with competing too definitely yeah I feel like the more I've competed and the more I've learned, like the more confident I've become. I, I would say I've always been pretty self-assured, but just being able to, like you said, say I'm going to do something and do it and do it well, it just adds. It's like, okay, I, I am able to face challenges. I am able to follow through. And yeah, it does. It does add a ton to your confidence. Even when there's little roadblocks, there are some things that happen outside of your control or you know, some choices that you make and you're like, dang, that could have been a better choice, but you just learn from it. Absolutely. Yeah. I think of it like self betrayal too, because if you promise yourself, you're going to do something and you don't do it. And then you're telling other people too, that's just even worse because then their perception of you is like dwindled too. Um, so you really have to focus on falling through and that's why it's better to just act and not to just like put things out to the universe sometimes too, like telling everybody you're going to do this big grand thing. It's like, just do it, you know, like yeah. just, like let the actions speak for themselves. Um, you also mentioned some ways that you keep uh, athletes motivated as well too. What are some things you do for that? Uh, I love using things that they've previously told me and bringing it back up for them. So if somebody said, we'll have conversations. And if somebody said, hey, I did this thing and I felt really confident in the gym, maybe you know, a couple of weeks later, they're not feeling so good. They're like, you know, I'm really tired. I feel like I've hit a wall. You know, this prep is really hard. I'll say, hey, you remember a couple of weeks ago when you did that thing in the gym, you know, you hit at that PR or you nailed your posing. It was flawless and you felt so confident. 
like bring that energy back up, you know, think about that, let that feeling kind of go through your body again and really just live through that and keep going. Um, but a lot of the time, I feel like I'm very lucky. My, my athletes are very motivated and sometimes I, I find it kind of funny, but sometimes they say that like, they don't want to let me down. Mm -hmm. And I, I have mixed feelings about that one because one, it's very flattering. Like I, I appreciate the like trust and the determination that they have in me, but at the same time, it's like, you shouldn't not want to let me down. You shouldn't want to let yourself down. And so I tell them that a lot. And I'm just like, listen, it's not about me. It's about you. You need to keep the promises that you make to yourself. You need to follow through on your word. And so just having those conversations with them and reminding them of how powerful they are and even maybe reminding them of their why I think helps a lot because we'll have those conversations too where they say, you know, I just really want to be great at something and I, you know, I've never been great at anything and I think I could be great at this. It's like, okay, remember that when those days come where you don't feel like going to the gym, just remember, hey, you said you wanted to be great at competing. Do you know what great competitors do? They go train even when they don't feel like it. So there's, there's a lot of little like aspects that I'll use of motivation with my athletes, but it's mostly just reminding them of like their own power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I really try to, you know, there it's a delicate balance with coaching because coaching, I really see it as like an art form because we have to like see an athlete and really paint this picture in so many different aspects and so many details to it and all these little dynamics. And the best thing we can do is really like balance that discipline piece with the motivation piece because we can't allow an athlete to be reliant on motivation because it's fleeting. It's, it's yeah. gone before you know it. And if they're just seeking this validation from us all the time, that's not good. And then they're super dependent on us to give them that level of validation. It's like, Hey, remember when you like, Hey, come on, like, let's go. Um, when really like we have to ride that balance of, we can't just be a cheerleader and a babysitter. We have to like instill discipline too, where it's like, Hey, you need to be self-sufficient here. Like, or, um, and be able to accomplish these things and get yourself where you need to go without like this excitement all the time. Right. You need yeah. to go to like, sometimes there is a point in time where you really have to be a robot. And, um, I'm like that myself too. I'm very, very disciplined. And I really did have over the years, I've very much disconnected from the discipline. I mean, the uh, motivation piece, I really do not rely on it at all. It's just, I just do it's, these things are just my duty. I just get them done and that's it. It's really that simple. And I find a lot of people negotiate with themselves too. It's like, they'll have this mental negotiation. I'm like, just do like, it's so cliche and like such a Nike slogan, but it's like, just, just do it. Like there's yeah. no, stop negotiating with yourself right so yeah. um i we talked about like little things that can help build self-confidence and one thing that impresses me about you a ton is how many things you do outside of bodybuilding to do that and to build your character and to develop yourself um tell us a little bit more about those things that you're doing and um some things that you're really excited about within that Thank you. I, I really appreciate that because I look up to you a ton. I think that you're an amazing coach and you've been doing wonderful things, not just for like the coaching industry, but just being a good person in general. So that that makes me I'm very flattered. I'm honored. Um, but yeah, some of the things that I really like doing. So I've always been a big reader. I love reading. So I started a book club here in Austin. I host that like once a month. And I just found that it's a good way to get people together. I have a personal goal of reading 50 books this year. So I felt like having a book club would kind of help me with that goal. So I won't lie, it was like a, a tiny bit like selfishly motivated, but I also just, I wanted to connect with people outside of fitness um, because as much as I love fitness and it is my passion, it's everything that I focus on every day, I do want to have those different outlets. I wanna have ways to just not even think or talk about fitness. So. I have a book club and I recently started attending Toastmasters club, which is, it, it's global, like it's worldwide, but it's a public speaking club. And the one that they have here in Austin is huge. There's over a hundred active members. So they have meetings every Tuesday night and it's like a, a conference hall just filled with people. And every week, four people sign up for a speech, you go up there and you get to practice public speaking. So you can sign up to give speeches or you can just be in the crowd, but then they'll also do this thing called table topics, which 
I love, but it's also so, it's so nerve wracking. So when you walk into the meeting, you put your name in a hat and like table topics, they'll ask a question and then they'll draw a name out of the hat. So you could be picked at random and you just go up there and off the cuff, you give a speech based off of whatever question or topic it is for the night. So Tuesday nights, actually the word of the night was resilient, which I was super stoked about because then the table topics kind of revolve around that. And unfortunately my name wasn't picked out of the hat, but every question I was so excited to go up there. Whereas like previous, I, I signed up for this club in like November. Um, and I used to just be sweating during the table topics. I was like, please don't pick my name. Like I don't want to go up there. And now I've gotten to the point where I, I want to go up there and practice my public speaking because I think someday I would love to either do like live podcast events where I do go public speak in front of an audience or just in general, like give public speeches. And so that's kind of a longer term goal that I have. So that's why I'm doing Toastmasters right now. I also think it just helps me be more articulate on my podcast and like here in our conversation, it helps me with, with the speaking aspect because otherwise I just feel like we're, we're always like on our phones or are doing our check-ins or whatever it is. And I recently started doing the loom videos. So I do get to talk a lot more, but previously, like when I first started coaching, I was just doing like WhatsApp, like paragraph responses. Right. So I'd spend the majority of my day silent. And I found that my speaking skills were not very good. I'd be in conversations and I'd have these really rich thoughts and then my sentences would come out and they were very bland mm -hmm. and I couldn't accurately describe what I was thinking or feeling. And I didn't like that feeling. So even though public speaking is a huge fear of mine or it used to be, I, what I've recently started doing is when I'm really scared of something, I, I go do it. Like I lean into that because more often than not, if I'm scared of doing something, it's because I, I need to, to go do it. So and you're like the only other person I know that reads uh, as much as I do. There's probably other people I know that maybe don't like talk, talk about it at all, but I think I'm like seven books deep this year so far. I'll admit a couple of them are audio books, but um, I don't read as much as I would like to. Um, but one of my favorite books I ever read was Quiet by Susan Cain. And the reason I read that book is that I have always been such an introvert. And growing up, I was extremely shy. If you put me in a social setting, I'm going to go hide in the corner and people are going to think I'm the weirdest kid there. Um, and so I've just kind of always been that way. Now, one thing you mentioned is that like when you first started doing Toastmasters, that it was like very nerve wracking. And it's like starting that those nerves are starting to die down a little bit for me, like it's because the body and the mind adapts right to stresses and for me it's like it just no matter how much i expose myself to the stress of it i just can't seem to adapt and or the adaption is ex extremely extremely slow would you consider yourself more of an introvert or an extrovert and i think it's like it's a spectrum kind of thing i think if you would have asked me five years ago i would have been like introvert but as i've gotten older maybe I do think I've drifted more to the middle of the spectrum. I wouldn't say that I'm like, I wouldn't say I'm ever really going to be like extremely extroverted because I think, you know, going out and, and being around large groups of people, it does really drain my social battery. I, you, you go home and you just all sit there after an event and I just need silence. Um, and I think that's probably why we love reading because it's just like you can just get enveloped into this world of the book. But yeah, I think probably like middle spectrum now. I did used to be very introverted, like to the point where my mom just used to say like, like, why don't you hug people back when they hug you? Like, why are you acting that way? Why aren't you speaking? She would always be on my case about socializing. And I, I, I just didn't want to be around people for a long time. And I, I can't tell if it's just because I've gotten older and now I've shifted a little bit or if maybe as a kid I was just more reserved, but probably middle of the spectrum now. Yeah, I've just accepted the fact that it's always going to be nerve wracking, but I find that if I see it as a skill now rather than it's something that's like a duty and a skill that I have to develop, 
And it's like, I have to put myself in this uncomfortable position, but the more equipped I am skill wise, the more I can, the better I can navigate it. And it's something that's inevitable and something I have to deal with because of my profession and stuff. So like when I go to a bodybuilding contest, for example, and I'm like shaking hands with other coaches and I'm like, what's up? Like you've seen me at shows. I'm like a completely different person than I normally am. And it's like, it's a, it's a kind of a mask to some extent. It's an act. And like, I have to develop those skills, but when I go home, like I am a like, complete recluse for like two weeks. Like it, I cannot be around people. I am so completely drained and miserable, but it's just, it's a, it's a duty and something we just kind of have to do. The loom videos do help a lot um, to develop that skill. And that's part of why I'm doing this podcast is to help develop that skill. And I find I can develop that skill better if it's just one-to-one conversations with other coaches and athletes that I'm kind of friends with. Um, because I do want to start hosting more seminars too, and that's going to be a level of public speaking. Um, but fortunately it will be like a lot of my athletes or other bodybuilders and I'll be surrounded by people I'm familiar with to some extent. So that should be helpful, hopefully, but I may need to get involved in something like Toastmasters to up my game of Tad. Yeah, it, I would definitely, I'd recommend like at least going to a meeting, just checking it out because they're usually pretty welcoming. Everyone's there is really supportive and have the people there are just as scared as you are. Like mm -hmm. I, I remember going and my voice was shaking because they made me introduce myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, this is ridiculous. Why is my voice shaking? But it just- yeah. That's very much how I am. Um, it's very valuable to do like community-based stuff like that too. Mm -hmm. um, so do you feel like you find a lot of like fundamental um, fulfillment, like purpose and meaning wise by connecting with other people like that? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think, something that really drives me like my purpose is serving others like helping others there's nothing that makes me feel better than just knowing what i did what i said how i helped actually did impact somebody so positively so that's really my biggest i guess driving force is when i'm done with competing or you know at the end of my life i want to be able to look back and reflect and and see that I made an impact, that I changed something, whether that is like an aspect in the sport or changing somebody's life through coaching or just anything that I can really do to help others, that just drives me a ton. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm trying to get, that's something I'm working on this year specifically and looking into more things I can be doing to impact others outside of fitness and bodybuilding because I've been in this industry for a very long time and, you know, we create this impact, but with bodybuilding, I find, cause I I've become relatively specialized within just bodybuilding. And I find that I battle a little bit mentally with myself because we are pushing things to extremes and it turns into more of a sport rather than us impacting people's lives to like a big, large extent. Right. So sometimes that net positive of impact can start to diminish a little bit with bodybuilders versus like, if we were helping somebody just like, get healthier, feel like facilitate better habits within their life, have mm -hmm. stronger relationships with people. Um, so sometimes I battle a little bit mentally and I'm starting to gravitate into other things. I really want to get involved in the big brother program at some point and be a big and yeah. like after a kid, a child at some point. So that's one thing I really want to do. Or um, I'm probably going to start volunteering at the Houston food bank. There's a lot of things I'm like looking into. Mm -hmm. I encourage anybody that's listening, especially if they're an introvert, to get involved in things like that because it can be very hard, especially somebody like myself where I really want to create an impact and I want to positively impact my community is putting yourself out there to do that to begin with. So um, I always find like the little things too I mentioned on another podcast, I can't remember which one, but um, even when I'm like grocery shopping, I make sure to take my grocery cart all the way back to the front of the grocery store instead of putting it back in the crawl. It's just like those little things, you know? I think that that is such a good idea to be a mentor, like be a big brother, because just my opinion, really, but I just feel like a lot of young men don't have a positive role model, like a male positive role model that they can look up to. And I think that for a long time, like for some reason, just the narrative in our society is like men are strong and they can get over it and they can do, you know, they, they don't have to process feelings like they're fine. They're, you know, we don't have to worry about men, but I, I really feel as though having that connection with a kid who probably needs a positive role model is just so impactful. 
like that's where you really can change the world because it is with our young people, it is with our kids. And I, I really think that young men especially need that. Like, I, I just think men need that role model. They need a strong, positive, like somebody who is successful and who can show them the ropes or at least just like give them advice or be there to listen. Like most kids just want somebody to listen to them and having that male figure would be so, so important. Like you, you would absolutely change lives that way. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. Cause I just think that, um, yeah, the men's mental health is definitely something of a lot of importance right now. And I think a lot of the, a lot of men are seeing a lot of things happen in the world and seeing them in very negative lights, but they're not taking responsibility for it. So they're, they're missing the, the piece of responsibility where they just need to be stronger leaders to begin with and stronger men to begin with and um, to open up to other men about these things and discuss these things and build character instead of just putting on this facade or um, having really ego driven behavior or just blaming all the other behaviors that the world's driving towards on everybody else. Um, whether it's women, whether it's whatever, the government, whatever it may be. I think taking more personal responsibility as men is extremely important. And I'm hoping to hopefully instill that in um, some kids as well. And, you know, I was somebody like, I got in a lot of trouble when I was a kid. I haven't really talked about this publicly ever. So this is like the first time I'm kind of doing this, but I got in a lot of trouble growing up, a lot of trouble. I was a, t I was a big troublemaker. Um, my parents were super stressed out all the time about all the shit I was getting myself into. But, and I've heard multiple, I heard from many authoritative figures, teachers, principals, that I was never going to be able to accomplish anything. And so me being able to have accomplished something of some level of significance where I'm impacting other people now and being able to explain that story to somebody who may be being told the same things, I think would be extremely valuable. And if I could do that, I'm just going to be a very happy man. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. It's it's going to go both ways. Like you'll be able to impart your story and, and give anecdote and say, I know where you're at. I've had this experience and hopefully they'll be able to have a different perspective presented to them and different possibilities. So I think that's really cool. I think you should do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I think a lot of kids are just surrounded by a lot of negativity and just being told that they'll never be able to accomplish anything. And I think, you know, we experience that too as coaches and as athletes where you know, we may be start to climb um, the ladder a little bit and people are like, no, 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 no. They're like trying to drag us down, whether it's for just um, haters on the internet or even loved ones sometimes that just want to keep us on their level or whatever it may be. Um, and I think um, especially like underprivileged kids that are coming from areas like that, um, you know, a lot of they're probably getting pulled down a lot. So just having somebody that will believe in them, I think can be very, very impactful. Yeah. I mean, we see it with our athletes too. And when, when we tell them we believe in them and, and we see their vision and their dream, sometimes they've never heard that before from a coach or from loved ones or from anything. They might not have anyone who understands their dreams. And so just having us there, I think is, is really important too, because we're able to tell them, yeah, I see what you're going for. I believe in you. Let's do the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think at the community level is where we can do that the most. I really think that the more impact we can make with just the people that are around us and the community around us, the more that's just going to spread out into the world. If we can help somebody else and give them the tools to create impact themselves, then that's going to branch out into networks that we weren't able to touch ourselves. So it's very valuable, and I wish more people would see it that way. But we talked a lot about um, adversities and challenges. And I ask everybody that comes onto the podcast, what is their number one piece of advice for overcoming a loss or a setback? Stay at the bottom for a second, stay in that loss, stay in that failure and feel those feelings and then move forward. There's a lot of times where like me, myself, I'll experience some sort of loss or challenge and I'm unable to sit with it. I just, I get myself up and keep going and I don't take the time to actually process and learn. I'm just like, oh, like, let me just keep going. If I just keep going, I can outrun the fact that I ever failed. But if if I could just sit in it for a second and and think, dang, I just failed or I just lost. Why was that? 
what what am I feeling right now? How can I process these feelings in a healthy manner and not just run from them? That has been extremely beneficial for me because I, I previously would not sit in my failures. I would not sit in the discomfort. I would just do everything I could to outrun it. And it might, it would look productive to other people. They'd be like, oh, wow, like, you know, you bounce back quick, but it's because I didn't actually process my internal feelings and they would catch up to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there would be another setback. So it's, it's really just when you're facing a loss, when you lose, it's okay. Like the world's not ending, but sit in it for a second, feel that because if you can feel it, really feel it and process it and move through it appropriately, those feelings aren't going to drag you down later, but now you can use it for fuel. You can use it as something to springboard you forward as you keep climbing. Those moments where you did bottle things up and maybe ran from it, did you find that that would manifest at times into resentment towards others? or towards the world in general or towards anything else where it would kind of externalize almost kind of subconsciously? I think so. Yes. There's, there's been moments where I had a loss and I was trying to just ignore it, move forward. And I would realize I would, I would be having a lot of anger towards something else. I'd be blaming something else or I'd find myself like really in victim mindset and I'd be like, wow, I am just not recognizing the role that I played here. Like, what, what is that about? Why am I so mad at this person or that thing? Or saying, you know, well, if this was different, I could have done this. Like, I, just blaming everything but myself. Just realizing that usually is enough for me to be like, hey, that thing that happened a month ago that you thought you were over, you're not over it. You need to, you need to deal with it. Um, so absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my biggest pieces of advice, too, for handling losses is to sit like I'm big on just like sitting in a dark room, like turn the lights off, sit and just think about everything that's happened, what you can learn from it and be constructive about it. And don't just like there's there's like sitting with it and like feeling what you're feeling and processing. Right. And it's a it's a processing thing. And then there's like just dwelling, too. Right. So you have to ride some level of balance. But I'm big on just like sitting in a dark room and going in with intention and being like, I'm going to process what is happening and what can I learn from it? It's happening for me, not to me. Um, and doing that real time rather than putting it off because it's there no matter what you do. And it's just going to stay there until you do something about it. And so if you don't do anything about it, it can oftentimes manifest into um, things that you may be completely like um unconscious or subconscious about whether it's vices um slippery slopes with that or um blaming others uh destroying relationships around you whatever it may be it's not a positive so um yeah. very valuable valuable stuff um yeah. what are some things that you have coming up that you're excited about i'm putting my first bikini athlete on stage this this year this summer we're about 12 weeks out if all if all goes to plan so i'm really excited for that show days as a coach is so different than show days as an athlete i've i've prepped and put on stage men's physique athletes so i've done men before but i haven't like prepped a woman and like peaked her and all that so i have the knowledge like the education is there but the the actually putting it into practice component i'm really really excited for so that is something that I, I honestly can't wait for that because I remember when my men's physique guy was on stage, my heart was pounding so hard. I, nothing else mattered, but just seeing him on stage. And there's just a different type of joy that you get. Like, of course we love competing, but when you have an athlete on stage, there's just a different feeling. Mm -hmm. I just, it's, it's like more than joy. It's just, Getting to see them realize their dreams and then knowing that you had a direct hand in that too is, is really special. So I'm already super excited for that. And then my pro debut, I'm I'm trying to ride the midline. I'm trying to be neutral and, and be like, okay, it's not here yet, but I am really excited for that time when it comes because I, I very much miss the stage. Absolutely. Um, that's very exciting stuff. The putting somebody on stage is indescribable. It's a it's an adrenaline rush, a combination of like an adrenaline rush and thrill, 
plus like a level of fulfillment because mm -hmm. you're helping somebody else and you're seeing their dreams come to life. Like you said, it's extremely fulfilling. And for me, like I said, I grew up doing a lot of extreme action sports. So like I've always been an adrenaline junkie and always like chasing like some level of thrill. So it's my channel for that. And it's like a level of fulfilling on top of that, which is just amazing. So I'm um, very excited and I'm excited for you. Um, tell everybody where they can follow you, reach you, um, podcast information, all that stuff. I want to get it all out there. Yeah. Uh, on Instagram, I'm Noah McCabe underscore IFBB pro and I coach for a team. So we have our a team athletes page and then I have my own podcast becoming relentless. And I believe it's just becoming relentless podcast on Instagram, but we stream on YouTube, Spotify, Apple pod. So if you wanted to hear more of my voice, you can hear me over there. <laughs> well, very exciting stuff. I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I know that your time is valuable. Like I said, you're somebody I'm very impressed by. You bring a lot of great energy into the industry. Um, your level of maturity is extremely impressive. Um, and just across the board, I think you're just an awesome person. So I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you. It was good to be here, Sean. I appreciate you. Thank you for joining us. Your journey towards excellence does not end here. We're here to help guide you every step of the way. For more insights and to become a part of our community, follow and subscribe. Your feedback illuminates our path. Be sure to share your thoughts and stay tuned for more episodes.